This is a different kind of Facebook. This isn't the regular Facebook I've been doing for a couple of years now. Folks, when we get a guest like Dr. Soraya uh, in here, it means I need you to hear what he's saying. Uh, this is a very special doctor. A couple of years ago, I was a keynote speaker at an event called Mycotoxins and Mold. It was out here in Dallas. And uh, in attendance was Dr. Mukesh Saraya. Um, and he listened for a couple of days and then sent me an email and said, I think this meeting changed my practice. So welcome and thank you for coming in. Um, we've known each other a couple of years. I think so. And yes. we've been a bit inseparable. We are <laughs> texting each other and uh, shooting things back and forth. Here's what I want to tell you, folks. I want you to look at me right now. Now look at that. If your grates in your home look like that, or if the ceiling in the bathroom looks like that, and we all know people. If yours doesn't, there's somebody watching now who does. This doctor wants to talk to you, and yet he's board certified both in internal medicine, well, the lungs are inside, and in pulmonary medicine. So a lot of, lot of education has gone into the making of this great man, uh, Dr. Soraya. Now, you don't go into patients' homes, but I bet there are people who go into patients' homes and look at, at this and then call you. This is a pretty good indication that there's a mold problem in the home? Absolutely, Doug. Um, so, being a pulmonologist, uh, 27 years in practice uh, in Denton, Texas, and, uh, you know, over the years, um, you know, the type of patients that I get into my practice are those that are coughing, uh, recurrent sinus infections, recurrent bronchitis. Uh, and, and being on antibiotic after antibiotic. And by the time they come to me, they've already been through, you know, four or five different antibiotics and steroids and on and off, you know, seasonal kind of, a lot of it is seasonal, a lot of it is persistent and chronic. So over the years, we've been looking to, to find out what the cause is in, in doing this. And, and uh, in effect, you know, basically we end up doing, you know, a procedure called bronchoscopy where we remove the mucus yeah, and, and, and culture that. And what we have been discovering is... Can, can I just ask you, a bronchoscopy, I scrubbed for a couple of those back, you know, a thousand years ago. Put the patient's head back, put the tube in, you anesthetize the patient. Yes. It just takes a few minutes to yes. do the whole procedure. It, it, yes. And you suck out some of that which is in his lungs, blocking him from breathing freely, him or her. That's correct, yeah. So, you know, it's an outpatient procedure. You know, you get anesthesia just like doing any other endoscopy, like colonoscopy. It's twilight sleep. Okay. Uh, literally takes me five to seven minutes to do. Yeah, and, and, and we go deep into, the, into both the lungs and, 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 and get a lavage, you know, with, with saline clean you know, salt water. So clean it and send it off for culture. So what we have been discovering over the last, you know, 20 years of my practice is that 80, 90% of these folks will not have a bacterial infection, that it's related more or less to mold. Well, wait a uh, minute, but 100% of these patients outside of your practice, yes. if I go see anybody at Mayo Clinic, we're going to get an antibiotic. Absolutely. And you're saying it's not bacteria. It is. A lot of times by the time they get to me, uh, you know, they've had three or four different rounds of antibiotics that haven't worked, which is why they seek, you know, out, out you know, uh, more looking for more answers. They end up, you know, com coming in to see me. By the time I, I see them, there's no more antibiotics to be given. They've already gone through the whole gamut of whatever is available you know, your Bactrims, your Augmentin, your Doxycycline. And, and when cultured, you know, you just find something that just was never treated, you know, which is mold. Why, why didn't the other, I mean, this is a procedure, a hospital, you have to go in a hospital and yeah. use their operating room there. It takes a few minutes. Why didn't the other pulmonologist test it? Well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's more common than one would think, um, you know, in terms of uh, the, the, the usual treatments. Uh, you you and I have had discussions where, you know, despite knowing, you know, that there is mold or fungus and no bacteria, you know, when patients get admitted to the uh, medical, uh, you know, care unit or intensive care unit, a lot of them get treated with very what we call broad spectrum antibiotics. Empirical uh, treatment. Uh, uh, um, all all empirical. It's yeah. not not culture based. You know, uh, uh, evidence based uh, uh, treatment. So uh, typically, if I were to go to an emergency room and I was coughing, hacking, um, well, you might think it's a virus, but I had a chronic problem. 
right? A chronic cough. This has gone on two years uh, since I went into grandma's basement. I don't know what it could be, have been in grandma's basement. I mean, pulmonologists will probably hear things like that, but the typical, and do you think it's because they're seeing 40, 50 patients a day? Just quickly, boom, out comes a prescription pad, write down an antibiotic, hand it to them. Do they well, get relief for a week or something? I, honestly, Doug, you know, before I met you and, and learned about mycotoxins, I was one of those doctors. And, uh, and although I knew that w what I was dealing with was mold and fungus, um, when I first started discovering, you know, the, the, the presence of mold in, in, in the lungs, I, you know, I was thinking more a uh, colonization, like the, uh, that's the common belief, that colonization is the, these are, are, you know, coexisting with you and don't need to be treated. You know, it's just there, it's in the environment, you're going to have it. 100% of people, you know, if, if you cultured them, they're, they're going to show the mold and, and yet, you know, they don't need to be treated. Uh, and yet, you know, conventional medicine ends up treating something that is not there, that we know is not there. You know, these are culture proven, you know, bio, uh, you know yep. bronchoscopies that, that pinpoint exactly, you know, what the cause is. And yet, conventional wisdom is, you know, that these are colonized, you know, organisms that do not need to be treated. So, in essence, what is going on is we are treating people, over treating people with, with antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics that are killing the bacteria, and in turn, there's an overgrowth you know, of, of fungal infections, both in the lungs and the GI tract. Are we creating uh, resistance, antibiotic absolutely. resistance? Because yeah. we're just shooting at you know, these little tiny spores with a cannon, I mean, all these antibiotics. How many bronchoscopies, since we've met a couple of years ago, how many bronchoscopies have you done? Maybe a dozen a year? <laughs> More? Oh, goodness. I do, I do, on an average, about 50 bronchoscopies a month. 50 a month. 50 a month. So since we met, maybe 1,000 to 1,500. Easy, yeah. You and one over a course of my career, you know. Okay, yeah. this is important information, folks. You need to hear this. This is unlike going to your regular ENT doctor, right, who looks in your nose, throat, ears, and says, boom, here you go, here's an antibiotic, maybe I'll give you a cortisone shot. This man wants to know the cause. Why is this chronic? Now, can I just go back to this picture? Sure. This is what you talk about with the patients. Absolutely. You sit them down uh, before you do the bronchoscopy, and well, it, it, the story is almost um, universal in terms of what I get. You know, information I get from. The, and again, I think you know, attending the mycotoxin conference, I think, uh, raised my level of awareness of where this mold is coming from, and a lot of it is, most of it is environmental. I think we live in homes that are traps. You know, that 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 are poorly ventilated, you know, homes that, you know, the ducts have never been cleaned. There's, there's not good, you know, filtration system in the air conditioning systems. Some of them bring me pictures back that are just unbelievable. You they know, take pictures they, in their bathroom the, or their home. Uh, absolutely. So I, I asked them, you know, I would sit down and, 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 and grill them as to where it's coming from. You know, we also use some inexpensive mold kits sometimes to just identify the number of spores that are present in, in, in the house. And, and then we focus on that area. And, and we've seen people tell me that, you know, it, it's in the, uh, in the drain system sometimes. You know, they, it's all clogged up, you know, with, with, with black mold. And you don't even see it. You don't realize it. You don't smell it. Um, you know, vents like this are not uncommon. Uh, I, I think the commonest problem I'm finding is in schools. Uh, the flat roof buildings, you know, with, with water leaks almost invariably, you know, like the rain we had today, you know, the, the probably pails of water, you know, buckets exactly. sitting, you know, uh, and the, uh, <laughs> under and the, the ceiling school leaks. Teacher, school yeah. teacher gets sick, and so you got a substitute for a week. Absolutely. Then the substitute gets sick, then the kids, <laughs> and, we, and we, we believe it's because the kids weren't vaccinated against the flu. But could it be mold in the ducting system? These you know, the other day I had a teacher who um, uh, had some pile of, uh, a box of books sitting next to his desk, and he spilled water. You know, the, accidentally there was a water spill and cleaned it up. And, and it sat there for, for a few uh, weeks. Uh, he then opened up one of the books and he said he felt immediately he knew what was going on. You know, the book was full of mold. This was with one spill. Yep. And, and he inhaled it. And since then he's got dizziness, he's, he's got a fog on his head, you know, he's got... Now, had I not attended the meeting on mycotoxins, I would not have put this together. You know, it is so easy to overlook this. Mycotoxins are organic volatile gases that are, are, are inhaled. You know, they're, 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 they don't have a smell. They don't, you know, you, you can't see them. It's invisible. 
and that get deposited in, into the fat. The brain is 67% fat and, and it's gonna get deposited into those, those organs. And I'm seeing more and more, the more I look at it, the more correlation I'm finding between neurological conditions such as you know, brain fog and, and tremors forgetfulness, and, and forgetfulness and yeah. all sorts of things. I mean, people are aware of these things as being, you know, coming out of sick buildings. Some but of these mycotoxins are tremorogens. Absolutely. I mean, they'll make, gee, I wonder what some of these diseases like Parkinson's are. Always look for mold. Become a FUPO head. Fungus until proven otherwise. I'll never forget, we had a little guy with asthma, two years old, three years old, four years old, and then he ended up in the hospital several times. And the mom, you know, said, gosh, our house is clean. And I kept that word clean. You know, the cleanest homes in America can have wallpaper. Do you remember how you glued that with water? And then the wallpaper went up right over his headboard. Remember, you want your carpet so clean when the family comes by for holidays that you'll get the whole carpet wet right on the slab or the plywood, all wet, and then suck up the carpet. But it's still wet underneath, folks. There are ways mold gets into a home that is absolutely amazing because we want a really clean home. Now, you and I have had this chat about diet. We know that fungi parasitize man. They get on board and they become a parasite. So they must be starved because if they eat, they'll live there forever and be happy. So teach me a little bit about that also, what you learned from that meeting. Well, um, it's just absolutely amazing, you know. And they, I do have patients that, you know, we have found the mold in the lungs. And and for whatever reason, you know, they, they are on, on, on other medications such as blood thinners that you can't use antifungals because right. they will make their blood very, very thin. There are those that have liver problems that you can't, you know, there are some medic medications that are, go through the liver and all the antifungals go through the liver. So there, there's some adjustments and dosing and, and, and monitoring to be done. So we do have patients that are unable to take antifungals, knowing what we need to treat it with, you know, but we can't. And, you know, that's when I started advocating the diet. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, you've been so helpful in that, and, and, and your website is just so good. I mean, just refer people to the website, and, and, and they learn so much out of that. So the phase one diet that basically eliminates, you know, the wheat. And, and, and you know, so many people think of wheat as gluten, but yeah. it's really not gluten that's yeah. a problem. I mean, you opened my eyes up to that. It's the mycotoxins in the, in the wheat that's a problem. So, you know, the other day I was in Minnesota, and, and I saw the, um, the wheat uh, silos up there. And it's so easy. I've actually spoken to people that work in those silos, and it's just absolutely filthy, you know, at the bottom of the, of the silos. Yeah. And and it's once I've explained that to the patient, they really do understand. So eliminating wheat, rice, you know, starches, you know, pro uh, processed foods, we've seen some amazing, amazing results. You know, they they lose weight fast without really cutting back on the calories, and they start feeling much, much better. You know, simply on the diet. Like we've had patients that are waiting on assistance on some of the antifungals. You know, we've got mm -hmm. some companies that help us with that. It may take two or three weeks for that to me a medicine to kind of come in and get, get started. In the meantime, they're starting the diet. So back up there, uh, because you've done the bronc, you've sent this off. And folks, this isn't a test that a lab can call the doctor in the afternoon and say, okay, positive to candida and fusarium and other molds, right? It takes a couple of weeks to grow this out on a plate for the accurate diagnosis. So what doctor will do is say, look, until we get the diagnosis and I can start you on antifungals, you're going to follow this diet. What's the name? Kaufman. You know, you're going to go on Kaufman's diet for a period of time. Then they'll come back in a week or two and see you, and already there, a lot of them are feeling better. A hundred percent better, most of them. Wow. So, you know, uh, uh, and it brings the point whether or not you know, they even need the antifungals at that point. You know, and, and, you know, these are folks that will come back, you know, Thanksgiving time, Christmas coming up, lots of sweets, and they will tell you that the minute they get off, I personally, I've seen that for myself, you know, I, you know, you eat a little pizza, and ever since you've been back, you know, I, I don't know if it's psychological, but I end up throwing that up at the end of the day, you know, I mean, I just would not be able to sleep, you know, if I ate that, you know, too much bread or, or pizzas and things like that. So I think the body recognizes, you know, when, when you're eliminating those things, um, uh, be it fungus or, or you know, the, the, insensitivity, the sensitivity that people have to some of the things are real, you know, and eliminating it will improve their, their allergies, their breathing, the coughing. 
um, you know, and, and sometimes, and I may do a CAT scan on them if I don't mm -hmm. see nodules mm -hmm. and it looks like, you know, that they're pretty clean otherwise and they don't have symptoms, I might not treat it. Let, let's talk a little science for a minute. You and I have shared so many. You know, you're going PubMed, right? And there's just dozens of articles talking about this mold that, folks, there's a type of mold called aspergillus, right? Aspergillus, a couple forms of aspergillus make a poison that causes human liver cancer, okay? So you can imagine how much you want to stay away from that stuff. The interesting thing is this aspergillus um, can get in the lung and then it encapsulates itself into a ball. We call it an aspergilloma. And here comes the CT scan, here comes the x-rays. <gasps> Do you smoke? And these patients say, no, I never smoked a day in my life. Well, you got lung cancer. You know, I mean, it's really interesting how sometimes, folks, I, I sent you that paper in Lung, the journal Lung, that 27 patients, a case study, 27 patients were told you have lung cancer, you don't have long to live, get your affairs in order. Then they did further tests on this lump and found out it was a ball of fungus, put the patients on antifungals and got them better. So my question to you is, do you see how I got involved in empirically helping you know, all these doctors I worked with, you know, when we first came to Dallas 30, 31 years ago, you know, we didn't do all the tests you do. Thank God for you and Dr. Dennis and other doctors who, who take specimens and really, but I would just tell people, look, until I see you next time, uh, maybe the doctor will give you a little nice stat and a little Diflucan for two weeks and start on my diet. And they'd come back in a couple of weeks. You can see how the science would be sidestepped. They're Absolutely. telling their friends, Look, you don't need Kaufman. Go on this diet. You know, so it's really science needs to enter into this arena more. I agree. You know, and the, and the way conventional medicine treats aspergillus to specifically is steroids. Yeah. You know, we when when uh, an asthmatic patient gets diagnosed to have aspergillus in the lungs, they are basically treated with nothing but steroids. You know, that uh, it's not believed that uh, I mean conventional, yeah. you know, wisdom is antifungals don't work, you right. know. And or they're it, it's so sad, you know, that, that steroids actually are pro, pro, probably, you know, producing the overgrowth of the fungus. You know, mm -hmm. my, my other concern in, in asthmatic patients, I had a young lady in my office um, just last week, 18-year-old. She had been around horses all her life, you know, and that's her life. And she can't breathe, you know, she's just so tight in her lungs. And, um, you know, being treated for, for asthma. And the only treatment that is out there for, for that is inhaled corticosteroids, which yeah, in turn, you know, yeah, you're, you're inhaling the yeah. steroids to decrease inflammation in the lungs. And asthma is inflammation. So no, not to undermine the, the importance uh, of, of inhaled corticosteroids, at the same time, if you don't know what's causing that asthma in the first place, which a lot of them have aspergillus, you know, uh, within the lungs, coming from hay, you know, they're around, you know, the horses hay. and barn Moldy and, and uh, they're, they're just, you know, yep. inhaling that all day. So it, it works two ways. One is uh, irritation, you know, that leads to the, 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 the production of, anti, of, of, of inflammatory substances that leads to the bronchospasm, but it also produces excess mucus, mucus plugs, and that is, you know, if you look up the literature, mucus plugs is really what kills people with asthma. So while inhaled corticosteroids have saved a lot of people from, you know, real bad asthmatic attacks, or used over a period of time and used inappropriately, you know, may actually be promoting the growth of, of the, of the uh, aspergillus, which again is treated with steroids and not with antifungals. And you bring up, you know, folks, have you ever heard of farmer's lung? So these farmers, where, when you bale the hay and you put it in, you know, the round or the square uh, bales, you leave it outside, you know, until the horse needs it. And there comes the rain. And there comes more rain. And then the farmer picks it up and he feeds the horse. These, these fungi grow a poison called a mycotoxin. You guys know this. You've been watching me for years. Those cause infertility, spontaneous abortions, breakthrough bleeding in horses and cows and pigs. But nobody publishes that in the human literature. Now, you would need a, a, a bale of hay, but you would eat wheat or corn you know, or other grains that have been siloed or sat outside for months and months. Sugar is a grain. And so it's really fascinating, a lot of studies, the agricultural science on mold and mycotoxins is huge <laughs> when it comes to humans, right? Well, I have a friend that used to work at uh, one of the pizza places uh, as a researcher. 
So I asked him, do you know about mycotoxins? I said, yes, we do, you know, and, and, and they're testing the levels and they make sure that the levels are, are not very high and so on. So the food industry has known about this for a very, very long time. Yeah. Uh, All, so year after year, we get more information. Corn was universally thought to contain mycotoxins, so be careful with corn. So what are we doing now? We're putting our gas tank you know, 10% ethanol. And, and we know that farm animals or other countries in Africa where they eat a lot of maize, they end up with a lot of liver cancer, right? So we have to be careful with that. Last two years, uh, wheat has really taken a hit. And, and not just with this aspergillus, but with other molds. So I said many years ago, I was working with Dr. Hughes at USC Medical School, why don't we just take everybody off grain? And the dietitians, you know, sitting at the table, oh! That's a sin, and if you're a Catholic, that's a mortal sin. You can't <laughs> stop eating grains. Where would we get our vitamins? And I was one of those quacks 45, almost 50 years ago that said, no, let's stop eating. And when I did, I felt great. I mean, it's really interesting. These mycotoxins have been around forever. We're talking more and more about valley fever, coccidio, inducing valley fever, causing it in California and Arizona, because it grows in the sand. They're saying now, we're seeing, boy, this valley fever has become a huge problem. There's always a huge problem. They're beginning to recognize it, thanks to shows like this and doctors. Do you have the occasion now to stand up in front of other doctors and talk about your discovery with mold and mycotoxins, and are you hugged or laughed out of the room? Uh, well, you know, I, as a consultant, I get um, patients sent to me. Hmm. Uh, with, when the patient is sent to me, you know, for you know, finding out what's, what, what's going on. The doctor says, you know, he's going to fix you. Do whatever he says. You know, it may sound odd, but do whatever he says. But these are the very doctors that don't for themselves advocate any of the, the information that, that, that I'm, I'm passing on to my patients. So, uh, you know, there's a recognition, you know, that whatever I do is, is working. But again, the desire to know what I'm doing is, is, is not there. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it, that's the unfortunate part that, that uh, I think education like this would really be very helpful. You're, you're providing a great service here. And then you are. So my job was to help you. You're much younger than me. Your job is to hang in there 20 more years and get the word <laughs> out. Folks, so when you hear alcohol is a mycotoxin, antibiotics are mycotoxins. So when you have someone who drinks every day because their cardiologist says, eh, a couple glass of wine can't hurt you, I don't believe that. Uh, and then if that patient is on antibiotics or eating ears of corn or eating cereal every morning, you know where I'm going with this. You just have to be very, very careful. Final words, where do you see this information in the year 2028, 10 years from now? Well, it, 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 from my experience of going back last 27 years, you know, this has become a, a very, very important aspect of my practice. Uh, understanding and recognizing it and how to treat it. And certainly in the last two years, um, uh, placing emphasis on the diet, the environment, um, uh, in use of, you know, judicial use of antifungals uh, is changing lives. You know, people uh, told to have end stage COPD, people told to have uncontrolled asthma all of a sudden, and being treated with, with very uh, harsh, uh, you know, medications that have a potential of actually making the condition worse. You know, you temporarily get better and then you get worse. So what I'm hoping to see in the future is, is more understanding, more recognition of, 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 of your diet, you know, of understanding, um, uh, you, you know, looking at the environment. I, uh, you know, I, 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 I was born in Kenya. I was, you know, I did some schooling in, in uh, India before I came here uh, in 1985. And as polluted as these countries are, uh, they don't seem to have the same respiratory problems that we do. You know, so many of them, you know, that I, in, I talk to in my office that have come from third world countries or underdeveloped countries are telling me I didn't have this problem back in Korea. Just yeah. two days ago, somebody, you know, and I kind of laughed and I said, you know, um, you know, for a country that's as polluted as China, India, you know, Korea, you know, for people to have that observation, I think a lot of it has to do with cross ventilation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being aware of eating more organic foods. Um, you know, uh, where I come from in the, uh, you know, India, you know, turmeric is, or, you know, curcumin, curcumin yeah. you know, your, your oregano. I mean, these are all natural antifungals that we have not 
necessarily understood as to what they do and why they keep you healthy. Yeah. But I, I do believe that that's where where we're going. So I'm hoping over the next 20 years that you know we we start focusing more. Um, you, we all know healthcare is you know it's becoming more and more complicated every day. It's mm-hmm. getting more and more expensive. Mm-hmm. I currently have a $6,500 deductible, you know, after paying $15,000 a year, you know, in, into premiums that don't do anything for me. I think most people need to take their health in, in their own, you know, control. Yep. I think they all need to look at their, their diet. They all need to look at the environment. Stay away from doctors, you know, that, that are treating you with empirically. You know, I think mm-hmm. you need to know what it is that is being treated. Uh, and... and um, know yeah, the cause. Know the cause. Know, understand, you know, what, what, what is causing the problem. Don't fix something that is doesn't need fixing, you know, yeah. and and and, and uh, go after that. So I, I'm hoping um, education through your shows and and others like yourself is, I believe, very very important. You need a Medicare card. No, we, don't, <laughs> we don't pay much. Money. And you know, you bring up a valid point. You look at India and China and so forth, and these people walking with masks on, and they don't have the respiratory disease. We're an affluent America. That means we can go to doctors and get lots of cortisone, lots <laughs> of antibiotics. Uh, yeah. That means that we can drink the finest wines and so forth. So I <laughs> really appreciate your time. Dr. Mukesh Saraya, S-A-R-A-I-Y-A. Dr. Mukesh Saraya out of Denton, Texas. Love you, man. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you, Doug, for you having know. me.